Elijah. What a great prophet. What a great picture we have of a, a wonderful man of God. But this mighty prophet of God, as we heard, read to us, is, finds himself in a very, very dark place. Not like any of us. None of us have been in such a place before, haven't we? Are you breathing tonight? I hope so. But this mighty prophet of God, once upon a time, was used by God in a mighty way, which we'll look at in a little while. And God used him in amazing ways during his lifetime. Some of those things, if you go back and read about him and see what, he, what God did through him, it is really amazing. You feel, you feel so small compared to what Elijah was doing. Elijah came from obscurity. He was a nobody. God called him and suddenly stepped out into biblical times, into, into biblical history. People know who Elijah is today. In most churches, I'm sure they know who Elijah is. If you haven't studied the life of Elijah, please do so. I can't cover all his lifestyle, uh, lifetime here, but he was born in 900 BC, before Christ, in a little village of Tishba in Gilead in ancient Palestine. He had a bold proclamation for King Ahab. God called him this unknown prophet and made him such a mighty man of God that he faced kings and spoke boldly to kings too. Elijah and Enoch were two people who were spared physical death in the scriptures. Enoch, as a Sunday school, story, a Sunday school teacher put it, uh, asked, this, asked her class, does anyone know what happened to Enoch? And all looked around, and little boy put his hand up and said, yes. Enoch and God went for a long walk one day. They used to walk every day. One day, he, they both walked and walked and talked and walked. And it got dark, and God said, why don't you come home, stay with me? That's what happened to Enoch. What a good story from a little child. But that's what happened. The scripture says, Enoch walked with God. No one found him after that. Same thing happened with Elijah, but it was different. A chariot of fire came down and took him up. How many would like to go up like that? Yes, I'd prefer to do that. But God knows. Must have been something special about Elijah for God to do such a thing. Spare him physical death. The Lord took them straight to heaven, both those Wonderful men of God. But in the third year of the drought that was in the land, God told Elijah to go find Ahab. And Elijah meets Obadiah on the way, a righteous man and an overseer of Ahab's house. He controlled everything there. Obadiah had already hidden a hundred prophets in caves because Ahab was trying to get them. But then Jezebel, <clears throat> Ahab's wife, tried to kill them. That's why he went and hid them. Elijah told Obadiah to inform Ahab that he had arrived now and he wanted to meet Ahab. And Obadiah was very cautious. Obadiah said, told Ahab, he said, I, I, I'm, I'm cautious, I don't want to tell Ahab that you're here because he's looking for you. What do you think Elijah said? I want to see him because God has sent me to speak to him. He ultimately did as Elijah requested, but when Elijah met the king, Ahab accused Elijah of being a troublemaker in Israel. You can read all about it in the previous chapters. Elijah told Ahab, listen, O king, I want to tell you something. He says, I want to be very real with you. I want to be honest with you. 
You are the troublemaker of all the nations. Anyone want to be a prophet? <laughs> to meet a king and tell him you are the troublemaker? Because Ahab was rejected, had rejected all the commands that God had given. He was against anything that God wanted. So Elijah said, I'm going to take you on, Ahab. I'm going to challenge you. I want to challenge you to bring all your prophets that you have, 450 of your prophets, the prophets of Baal, the idol worshippers. I want you to bring those 450 plus the 400 other prophets of Asherah. So that's 850 prophets. And I want you to bring them out to Mount Carmel and there we'll see who serves the living God. Anyone still want to be a prophet? That's a bold statement, isn't it, from a prophet? But that's what, that's what Elijah did. Why is Elijah now in this position? We need to know that what I gave you a little while ago is a summary of chapter 18. If you read through chapter 18, brings you to chapter 19 after the battle that was fought on Mount Carmel. When Elijah prayed to his living God, made fun of the 450 prophets who were trying to sacrifice and call down fire from heaven. Couldn't light it. And you know the story there. When, when Elijah called upon God, he also got them to pour buckets of water on the sacrifice so it won't light. Try pouring water on everything that you want to light before you light a barbecue. And then try to light it. But God sent down his fire and proved. And, and so much happened. I'll let you read it. Ahab reported these events that happened on Mount Carmel to Jezebel, who was hunting prophets to get rid of them. And when she heard what Elijah had done and the 450 and 400 other prophets were no more, she got angry. She resolved to kill Elijah. Now, I want you to put yourself in Elijah's position today and say, if that's what the king's wife commanded of me, what would I do? We don't have time today to go around and say, what would each one of you do? Let me have three suggestions. What would you do? If Jezebel said to you, I'm going to kill him, what, do you, what would you do? Come on, be bold. Run away. Good on you. That's what Elijah did. You got the best one, so that's, that's fine. I don't need to ask any more. Most people would run away. Listen, what, listen to what we read in verse 1 of chapter 19. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. She said, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I don't have you killed. So she gave him 24 hours notice saying, I'm going to kill you in 24 hours, but may my gods kill me if that doesn't happen to you. Just as you had killed those other prophets, I'm going to do to you. Now, Elijah focused only on negative things. Most people today, you find even you too, I too have to correct myself and say, don't look at the negative side, look at the positive side. And we look at the negatives, and Elijah focused on the negatives, and he fled south of the promised land into the territory of Judah. Exhausted in running away, Elijah spent the night under a broom tree, it says in one translation. And I, I looked it up to see what does a broom tree look like. It looks like a little umbrella. Gave him a little shade and covering, so he's snuggled up under the broom tree. And we read that in verses 3 to 5. 
In the first part of verse 5, it says, Elijah was afraid when Jezebel challenged him. And he fled for his life. That's why he fled. His life, he was looking at, I'm not ready to die. He forgot that he was called to be the prophet of the living God. And many times we forget who we're serving, who we're living through each day of our lives when we face difficult times. We forget that we are serving the living God. That's if you are. But he, he fled. He ran to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day by himself, running from this woman who said, in 24 hours, you'll be dead. He sat down under this, another solitary tree, and prayed that he too might die there before she killed him. Have you ever prayed the prayer? Lord, take me now. I've come across people who've prayed that prayer. Lord, why don't you call me now? Take me now. I've never prayed that prayer because, you know, I, I don't want to leave this earth until my work is complete, which is another 38 years more. Amen. <clears throat> I have had enough, Elijah says. Take me, Lord. I've had enough of this. I can't take it anymore. Have you come to a place in your life like that? When you say you're, you've hit rock bottom and you're saying, God, I can't take this anymore. Here's a despairing prophet. Here's a prophet who's, who's depressed, running for his life, exhausted now after running for a whole day. Take my life, for I'm no better than all my ancestors who've passed on before me. They've already died, Lord, so why am I here? Take me too. Then he lay down under the broom tree and went to sleep. And he thought, now sleep, a good night's sleep will do well for me. That night, an angel came to him. Actually, that chapter tells us he came twice to Elijah. The first time, in verse, the second part of verse 5, it says, but as Elijah was sleeping, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones. That's what one translation says and a jar of water beside it. Now, the, think of Elijah has been running for the whole day in the hot sun in the desert, in the wilderness. And then he comes to this point where he's exhausted and he's dozed off. And now the angel says, here's some hot bread for you. He must have been hungry. He must have been thirsty. So he ate and drank and lay down again to sleep. But then again the angel touched him the second time and said, get up and eat some more. He says, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead of you will be too much for you. Now Elijah didn't realize where he was running. He's trying to get away as far as possible from his problem, Jezebel. And sometimes I've come across people who try to run away from their problems. They try to hide from their problems. They try to get away as far as possible from their problems. God has not called us to run. He's called us to stand. And he called his prophet to stand. Prophets are called to stand for God and as God would direct them to declare to the kings and to the nations, what God is saying. But here was God's prophet running. A good example, a good ex illustration for not just God's people, but for God's servants. Like us, Pastor Duncan, myself. We don't hit these kind of issues or problems. I don't think so. You do. We do. We do hit them quite a lot in pastoral ministry. 
But when we hit them, it's a good illustration of what Elijah did and what God wanted him to do. He ran away from what God expected him to do. And that's the time that we have to remind ourselves too. God has called us here to serve him. God has given us his word to deliver it. Let's do it with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul, with all our strength, even if it's uncomfortable sometimes. And Elijah didn't want to face that anymore because he thought after that great victory on Mount Carmel, he had won the battle. But a woman made him run. And he forgot to, he took his eyes off the God who called him. That's what happens to us, to you and me. Once we take our eyes off the God who has called us, and we put our eyes on the things around us, or the situation you're facing, or the difficulty, or that difficult person that you're dealing with at your work spot, in your college or university, or wherever you go, we come across difficult people. As long as you live in this world, I, I've learned that there's lots of difficult people to work with. Am I right? Only four people agree. The rest you'll meet them, I'm sure, in your lifetime. But when, you, when, when Elijah did this, he was dis depressed. He was upset. He never thought, God, you've brought me so far, you can take me through. In verse 8 of this chapter, it says, so he got up the second time when the angel touched him and said, okay, he ate again and drank again. And the food gave him enough strength to travel how long? 24 hours? No. 40 days and 40 nights. Have you ever had a meal and traveled for 40 days and 40 nights without having another meal? None of us have. But that's what the scripture says. And he ran for 40 days and 40 nights and he ended up on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. I like that. He finally landed up and must have said, this is where I really belong. Sometimes God allows us to go through some difficulties or meet some difficult people that we, can't, we find it difficult to cope with. But when we come to that place again and say, God, you are here. And that's where Elijah came. He came to Mount Sinai. What was Mount Sinai uh, special for? Anyone? Recall your Bible reading? You know, I don't just preach at you. Moses met God up on that mountain. That's why it's called the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. Moses met with him and God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. How many times? Twice. Now, I'm not telling you why he gave it twice. I want you to find out. And I'm going to check with you one day. The angel told him, eat up, Elijah. You've got a long journey to make ahead of you. You've been running for one day. You've got another 39 coming. Oh, no, 40 coming. Because he ran for 40 days after eating that food. And the angel told him to sit up and get ready for that long journey. After eating that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights in the strength of that food. I began to think about that and said, in today's context, what is that food for you and me? Can any, anyone have any suggestions? Wow. What do you think is that food for you and me today? Who told you you, can't, you can't, must not talk in church? You can. You can talk to me. No one wants to answer. The Word of God. The Word of God is food for our spiritual life. If you don't feed yourself on the Word of God, you will not grow to be strong. 
And here was Elijah, who after eating that food, went for 40 days and 40 nights. Two meals he had and two jugs of water. And he went for 40 days and 40 nights. Some of us think we come on a Sunday and we get fed and that's enough to take us through the week. Try doing that physically and see if it works. I challenge you. You may go for a week, but you won't be, do, be doing that again. Elijah went in the strength of that food that he received from that angel. The angel was sent by God to feed him something more supernatural. My imagination ran and thought, that bread was not cooked on earth. It was cooked in the bakeries of heaven, that bread. And that's the living bread that you and I must feed ourselves on. If you, if you heard the message preached last Sunday, I think it was last Sunday, I am the bread. That's what Pastor Duncan said, Jesus is that bread. And if we don't feed ourselves on the word of God and his word and appropriate it, get nourished from his word, we will not be able to travel a single day without it. Get into a discipline. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, there are disciplines that we have to follow. One of that is to feed ourselves every day. I do. Every morning, as soon as I wake up, I worship him. That's the first thing I do every morning. The second thing I do is feed myself on the word of God and say, speak to me, Lord. Not what they are saying there, but what, am I, what are you saying for me today? And I try to live that out, what he said to me each day, in his strength. In verse 9, the first part of verse 9, it says, There he came on Mount Sinai. He came to a cave where he spent the night. He's still hiding. After running for 40 days and 40 nights, he still comes into this cave and he hides. God's plans will never be stopped, regardless of where we find ourselves. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for my life. And we can't run away from God's plan. His plan will never be changed for you. What is God's plan for your life? Have you discovered it? Even before you were born, God had a plan for you. In verse 9, the second part of verse 9, it says, But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And some of us need to hear that question from God in our lives. Sometimes we get off the track. Sometimes we let other things come in our way and distract us from God's plan for our lives. That is the time that we need to say, to hear that voice again, that still small voice saying, what are you doing? Put your name in there. What are you doing, Charles? What are you doing, John? If there's a John here. What are you doing? Where are you? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served you, Lord, God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down their altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me too now. Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing? Can you hear God calling you today and saying, where are you? What are you doing? Are you in my plan or have you deviated from my plan? That's what Elijah was facing here. Elijah seriously needed a radical attitude adjustment. And many of us need that today. We need to get our attitudes adjusted to get back to what God expects us to be. Not what anyone else expects us to be. There are times when we find ourselves in such a place as Elijah finds himself right here. And it's up to us to, to, to decide what do we want to do. We too get discouraged. Do you, does anyone not get discouraged? Not a single hand. Look at that. 
No, mine was not up. I get discouraged too. We all, it's part of life. We do get discouraged, so don't, don't, don't be upset. Don't beat yourself up with that. We too get discouraged. We too feel defeated. And this gets us down like it got Elijah down to. And this is put in the scriptures there for you and me to take note of. If we don't read the scriptures, we won't know this. And if we read the scriptures, we'll take heed to it and say, if that's what Elijah did, and that's what God corrected him for, I need to correct my life too in obedience to his plan for my life. We too are, are overly pessimistic when it comes to facing discouragement. We say people are pessimistic or are they optimistic? Where do, you fit, where do you sit today? I don't think there's a middle ground here. <laughs> you're either optimistic or you're pessimistic. You can't be in the middle anywhere. And as God's people, with God on our side, as Elijah should have known, I serve the Almighty God, Yahweh. Then he would have said, no matter what I'm going through, Lord, you're with me. And for us today, after the cross, after Jesus, we should say, I listen to the words of the master who said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. If you put your hand in the master, he's with you. Trust him. Some of us might be there right now where Elijah finds himself. Sitting right here now, you may be in that position today. Elijah was in a place that he should not have been. But God was not finished with Elijah. I got good news for you too. God's not finished with any one of us, including me. That's why I'm still here. He's not finished with me. He's got more things to teach me. He's got more things to teach you. If only we take heed to what his word is saying. But God planned even in that condition, to restore Elijah. You need a fresh vision, God said to Elijah. I want you to start focusing your eyes somewhere else, Elijah. I want you to start paying attention to what I'm saying and not what others are saying around you. Verse 11 tells us, God spoke to him in that cave and he said, Go! out and stand before me on the mountain. That's what the Lord told him. Go out and stand before me. When did you last hear the voice of the master speak to you? Have you started learning, training yourself to hear his voice? I had a young person come to me some years ago and say, how do I know it's the voice of God? I was a much, a much younger pastor at that time. I began to say, well, I said, you must listen to the word of God, read the word of God. I began to think about that. And the more I began to think about it, I began to realize the voice that you are closest to, you would hear the clearest. It's the voice of the world. If you're spending more time with the world and not with God, that's the voice you'll hear. If you're spending time with yourself and you're all self-absorbed, that's the voice you'd hear of yourself. If you're listening to all the other voices around you, by, by the way, the enemy of your soul is always there too, speaking. Do what Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Always put him behind you. Always say that, get behind me. Sometimes you may hear me saying that sometimes. I do say that. And I apologize to the person in front. I didn't say that for you. The enemy is trying to get between us. Get behind me, Satan. This is what Elijah is facing here on this mountain. And God says, Elijah, get out. Get out of your pity party. Come and stand before me on the mountain. And it's time for some of us to stop where we are and ask ourselves, am I where God wants me to be? Am I standing where he asked me to stand? I am still working behind the scenes, Elijah. 
I have not stopped working with you. I have not stopped planning for you. Verses 11 to 13 says, And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. I want you to picture that scene. Elijah standing there and a great mighty storm hit and went past him. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in that wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. Everything shook around him, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard that whisper, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. He humbled himself. Sometimes you never hear the voice of God when all the excitement and the and all the things that you're involved with, all the noise and the clamor around you, the strong winds that are blowing around you. Sometimes your world may be shaking, but God's not in that too. Sometimes may, you may feel like you're in the fires and the fire around you is raging, but God's not in that too. Listen to that still, small voice. When I thought about those words, I thought to myself, who in the scriptures heard that still small voice? And I thought of, I thought of a, few, a few others, but I, I remembered little Samuel praying. And he heard the low voice of the Lord speak to him for the first time. He thought it was Eli. He went to Eli and said, Eli, did you call me? No, I didn't call you. Okay, go back. Second time, you know what happened. You know the story. If you don't know, read it. And the third time, Eli woke up and said, this must be God speaking to this little boy. I'm trying to teach my little grandson to listen to God's voice speaking. He's, on, he's, not, he's still two, going to be three in November. I'm teaching him to learn to listen to Jesus, listen to the voice of God. Wouldn't it be great if my grandson hears the voice of God like Samuel did? I'll be thrilled. We today, you and me, need to say to our souls and our lifestyle, you need a place, a place of quietness, of peace, to hear that still small voice. Verse 13 says, second part of it, and the voice of the Lord in that still small voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? That woke Elijah up. Did it? Well, if it did, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing here. Verse 14, he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down the altars, they've killed everyone, and all the prophets, Lord. It's time, Elijah, God says, put aside that stubborn, pessimistic attitude that you're living in right now. Enough of this, Elijah. Get back on track where I want you to be. And then verses 15 to the end says this. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came, Elijah. Travel to the wilderness to Damascus. And when you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king over Aram. Then anoint Jehu, the grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel. And now, the third one is most important, Elijah. I want you to anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, 
from the town of Abel Mehola to replace you as my prophet. What a, what a word. I would have been devastated if God said that to me. If God said, Charles, you've let me down. You've tried to run away from what I wanted you to do. So I want you to anoint someone else who's going to take your place. That would break my heart if God said that. I'd feel, I've let you down, Master. Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu. And those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet, I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed their knee to Baal or even kissed him. God is looking for men and women today like that. This passage has something to say to you and me during these times that we, during those times that we go through in our struggles. I've been through a little struggle recently, but this afternoon I was thinking about it in the light of what Elijah faced and what God would say. And I, you know what I came up with? I've just faced a small hiccup. That's what I told myself this afternoon. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that hiccup. What are you trying to say to me, Lord? When you find yourself in this place like Elijah did, rest assured that God will see you through it. He, he's asking you the same question. He's asking me the same question as he asked Elijah in verse 9. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here today? We need to be very careful when we start living on assumptions. We must be very careful because too often our assumptions fail to take into account the sovereignty of our God. He is sovereign above everything. Do you serve the sovereign God today? I do. Nothing, nothing can stand and no one can stand against the living God, the true and the living God. That's why I'm, I'm bold enough to tell everyone, even the taxi drivers, about my God. He is alive. There's no one else beside him. Elijah thought because he was at his wit's end, so too God was at his wit's end. That's what Elijah must have felt. Oh, that's the, that's the impression I get reading for, of him running after God showed him on Mount Carmel that he is still the mighty God who can, who can do mighty things that humanly is impossible and he still ran when a woman said I'm going to kill you in 24 hours but Elijah was dead wrong as far as God is concerned never rule God out folks even today are you in the place where like Elijah found himself let me encourage you to close off pay attention to the voice of the Lord don't fill your mind only with the scriptures. Fill your heart with the word of God. And say, Lord, use that word as your food for my soul, for my life, for my journey through this lifetime. He wants to lead you and me out to a place where he wants us to be, into the place of blessing, glory, victory, power in the name of of the risen Lord. Hallelujah. If he's speaking to you today, if his spirit is saying, yep, I want to whisper to you too, then now is the time to listen to that still small voice that Elijah finally heard and then obey that voice and you'll be the better for it. I know that from, from a reality of living with the master for many years. Listen to that still small voice 
and obey what the voice says. And Father, I thank you for that word to my heart too and to all our hearts here. We all face difficult times. We can get discouraged. We can get depressed. We can run away. We can get exhausted like the prophet did. But we serve a mighty God. Help us never to forget that and to obey that still small voice at all times. I pray this for myself, for my brothers and sisters here, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.